Uh, workshop meeting today is September 20th, 2018. Could I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Kazuanas? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Ms. Hinton? Here. And Ms. Caldwell? Here. Uh, agenda mm -hmm. number 3.0 workshop. So, at this time, I'm going to introduce our Director of Curriculum and Assessment, Monique Culbertson. Uh, Monique tonight is going to give us a high-level overview of our grading and reporting across the district from K all the way up through 12, um, and also give us a little sneak peek at what we know about what the state has decided around proficiency-based diplomas or diplomas in Maine in general. So with that, I'll turn it over to Monique. Thank you so much. I have some copies here for the presentation. Um, what I'd like to do is to go through the presentation at the very end. We can open it up to some questions. So if, as questions arise, if you could just jot those down, we can um, respond to those questions at that time. So welcome, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be back here again and to be talking about grading and reporting. I would like to orient you to our mission um, of particular attention. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but keeping in mind, we're here, and it's all about developing resilient lifelong learners in our students. It's not just the content area, it's about resilient lifelong learners. And that will be important to us as we think about and talk about our grading and reporting practices. Likewise, in our long-range vision, it's all about the whole child approach. So in our grading and reporting practices, there are different components of the learning that we grade and we report on as well. And lastly, in terms of our values, those resilient lifelong learners, we are committed to preparing them not just for college, but also for career and civic readiness. So it is a tall order, and we are up to it, and I'll, we'll show you just how that is reflected in our grading and our reporting process. Uh, what are report cards and for whom? Back in 1999, believe it or not, there were six different report cards at K-5. None, no one report card um, focused on completely on academics, some focused completely on the social emotional aspects, we took a K-5 report card committee and we took two years, gathered lots of input from parents, developed drafts, and came up with a K-5 report card, one report card for K-2, similar report card for K-5. So we're coming up on about 16 years or so on that report card. So yes, it's a report on achievement, but also progress, but in all components of the learning, not just the academic pieces. And we do report at certain points in time, and I'll go over what that looks like here in the district. We also report on attendance, because that's an important factor for <coughs> learning. If they're not in school, we can't work with them. But we have a tall order for our report cards. We want those report cards to be to students. They need to speak to the teachers, the next teacher in the next year, but also to parents. And our high school transcript needs to speak to an even broader audience. So it's a tall order for a report card. What we're learning is that there are some grading practices that we can shift in our schools and working with our students that can help improve learning. So you're going to hear me repeat over and over again. We're working to move from grading of the learning, which is usually final, to grading for learning. One of the things that we're learning is that the we're actually learning, sorry, no pun intended, is that there's a tension between the two. And so we're looking for a balance between those two things. Because in order to develop those resilient lifelong learners and for us to focus on the whole child and getting them ready for college and career and civic readiness, we want them to focus on the learning rather than just the grades. Grades are important, but we want them to also focus on the learning as well. And our reporting, our grading practices can help with that, but that does have an impact on our reporting as well. Monique, before you continue, just a quick sound check. Can you speak into the microphone? Do I need to hold that? Um, you can either hold that or you can just use the one that's at the podium. Okay. Just so that way. So maybe I need to stop moving around. <laughs> it might be hard. That's hard to do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll work on that. So our report cards, which we often refer to as progress reports, K-5, we report each trimester. And that's a paper report. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 6-8 each quarter, high school each quarter. 
At the middle school, it's a paper report card as well as electronic. We have access to an electronic system. Students and parents have access to that so they can see all the different pieces of the grading process. We also have parent-teacher conferences where parents can learn about achievement and progress of their children. But there's also other parent and teacher communication as well in terms of reporting. Parents are encouraged to talk to their classroom teachers and teachers will often send home um, either weekly updates of what went on in the classroom uh, or newsletters monthly, different varieties of communication different teachers in our district use. So K-5, there are two components in the K-5 report card, guiding principles, which are state law, uh, and the content areas. This is a graphic of the key that is used in those report cards. This was developed as a result of the work from the feedback from community and teachers. We use beginning, developing, competent, and strong with pluses and minuses in order to uh, provide feedback to students in the classroom teachers use that, but we also use it for reporting. This is a graphic, just a snapshot of pieces of the report card. You'll notice Scarborough's guiding principles, the responsible involved citizen, clear and effective communicator. Those pieces have been around since 1997. And then we do what is, because English language, arts, and mathematics are large portions of the child's day, we break those out into what's called standards reference categories in those areas because it gives both the students but also parents um, an understanding of what the relative strengths and weaknesses are in the part of the students in those areas. And then we just report out on those content areas at K-5. So one of the things that we, oh, also the, another component is effort. <coughs> um, the teachers way back when needed to define effort because it could be different in across all classrooms. And so the definition of the, on the report card is focuses on task and strives to do quality work and we use an outstanding satisfactory needs improvement and it is um, reported each trimester for that. K-5 folks have been talking about potential shifts. One big piece is to try to get that report card um, electronic so that it will be easier to access on the part of parents, but also for us to do data analysis in order to grab the data from the report cards in order to inform either instruction for the classroom teacher, but also in terms of keeping a gauge on how our st students are doing. The guiding principles, we have the guiding principles on there. We need to try and sort out what's the effort piece and what are these habits of work and learning, which are behaviors. We need to clarify those, separate those, and really simplify those. We've got batches of those pieces going on in each um, phase level. But again, in this redesign, both in terms of grading practices and reporting practices, we're talking about a different report card. We're not necessarily talking about significant changes in the um, uh, grading practices. But again, this report card needs to speak to students, parents, and teachers. I'm always an advocate of we need something that is going to fit on the refrigerator door at home. Um, I know some of you have talked about these 16-page standards reports, and my piece is if it can't fit on the refrigerator door, it's probably too big. <clears throat> this I added this slide in order to get a little bit of an understanding on how we divvy out this thing called habits of work and learning, this thing called guiding principles in these content areas. So this is just a reference piece. I'm not going to talk about it too much. But the habits of work and learning are really about those behaviors that are helpful for all students to become successful in their academic careers, in their careers um, in actually post-secondary, both in college and career and civic readiness. Um, and I'll show you some examples that the middle school and the high school have developed as well. Guiding <coughs> principles, we're still having lots of conversation about whether those should be included on the report card or not because we're really looking at students identifying evidence of those because those are skills that we are constantly working on. I'm still working on being a clear and effective communicator. I'm practicing it tonight, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and so what pieces of evidence might students choose to include in their portfolio or their collection of evidence that show that they're growing in these areas. And so I know the middle school has a portfolio. That's one way in which the middle school folks are doing that. Um, the high school, um, there's a group of faculty who are designing some sort of um, demonstration with lots of flexibility and choice for students to be able to demonstrate what they are have learned and the progress they've made in these areas for graduation. 
So let's shift gears to middle school. The middle school just underwent, oh, got to stop moving around. Um, they have a new grading and reporting process this year, and this is the result of extensive feedback from not only teachers, but students and parents as well. And so changes in the grading and the reporting practices, um, and I'll go through some of those pieces, are a result of the feedback and a process by which we continually strive to make improvements in what we do. It is a balance between that grading for learning and that grading of learning which is often on a report card. The electronic is available. It's just recently made available. We've been working on some um, technical uh, hurdles that some of which we've overcome and some of which we have plans to continue to overcome. But then the paper version I can't share with you tonight because we're still under development um, trying to get that to look the way we want it to look. For more information, there is a grading and reporting guide and the middle school will be launching at some point this week a website with more information on all of those pieces and I usually will PDF this and link it to um, the curriculum site uh, as well. So the component in the middle school and the high school, which is different than K-5, is that the instruction in the curriculum is organized and delivered in what are called courses, courses of study. In the middle school reporting component, there will be a scale. It will be a 0 to 100 percentage scale. There are three categories that the middle school will use, classwork, homework, and assessments. Classwork and homework are those categories where students can learn and practice. They still count in a formative way, but they learn and practice and grow in what they're trying to master. Alongside of that is that all assignments are attached to our learning goals. The evidence is pretty clear that when students know what they're learning, why they're learning it, and know where they are in relation to mastering that skill or category, <coughs> they learn more and they learn better. And so those curriculum standards and learning goals are attached to the assignments and the students can see the feedback scale, which is meets, partially meets, exceeds, very similar to beginning developing competence strong to give feedback to those students on where they are. Um, this language is just different. The middle school is also reporting on the HOWLs, the habits of work and learning. They have organized those behaviors around academic responsibilities and social responsibilities. So they work with the students on building both of those. The scale there is a frequency scale. How often the teacher and the student, how often the student demonstrates those behaviors. The more often they demonstrate, the more the odds are that it is a habit. And we want to build good habits in students for learning. So a couple of examples of what academic responsibility might look like. It means bringing your stuff to class. It means being prepared, bringing the pencil, bringing the pen, bringing the laptop, taking initiative to make up assignments, turning them in that meet the requirements, demonstrating academic integrity. The social responsibility side, behaviors that are equally as important, is to follow the school and classroom rules. It is to collaborate with others. It is to support each other in learning. But it's also having that positive attitude and being engaged in what's going on within the classroom. So we want to give students feedback on these skills because we feel that they are necessary for success, both in post-secondary endeavors, but also in career and civic participation. At the high school, the reporting component are courses as well. That scale, that zero to percentage scale, is used to report on the courses. High school is a little different in middle school because there is this thing called credit. Credits are earned as part of a graduation requirement to show as one form of demonstration of mastery. The categories at the high school are flexible. They vary by teacher, teacher or by department. Some teachers of like courses will come together and develop similar categories, um, but it depends on the teachers and the departments there. But also at the high school, we have that reported feedback that the assignments are connected to the curriculum standards and learning goals. And the primary purpose there is, again, to give feedback to the students. That scale isn't meets, partially meets, not yet, exceeds. And we use the symbols of 4321 instead of the letters to indicate that feedback to students. On the electronic grade book, that shows. The high school does not do a paper report card 
but as we're going to beginning to have conversations about making improvements at the high school that may be a piece that we also include as a paper report card a little old schools i like having that report card on the refrigerator door and giving every student the opportunity to do that maybe a little too old school <clears throat> The high school also collects and tracks and gives feedback to students in three areas of habits of work and learning. They, in essence, are preparation for learning, engagement in learning, and respect for self and others. So those descriptors that you saw at the middle school are teased out into three different categories as opposed to just two categories. And this is an area that the teachers are having conversations about and talking about, and they will be learning more about what's going on at the middle school to see what kinds of changes we want, want to make in those. Likewise, the uh, scale is a, uh, the symbols are numbers, but the scale is also a frequency scale because it's a behavior that we're trying to promote. The high school transcript, this is um, a copy of the a current high school transcript. And with the shift in graduation requirements towards the proficiency-based piece, we've had a lot of conversation about what might a transcript look like um, that contains some of that information, not necessarily all of that information, just because it's a lot of information when you take into account all of the learning goals. But some important considerations are we want to communicate all that students can do, not just courses and grades and credits. Um, we recognize that a transcript really does almost need to be a resume these days versus a transcript, because it really is about what students can do. And it reaches a wide variety of audiences. Um, in the past, the goal was always four-year college, four-year college. But now the language has shifted to pursuing credentials of value. Credentials of value, some of which may be a student may be interested in a four-year college path. They may be interested in a two-year college path. They may be interested in um, jumping right into the job market at first because that position comes with it um, support and benefits which will allow them to go to school at the same time at very little cost and they will be getting paid for it. So there are more options now for students to pursue. Um, and so we want to make sure that the transcript, and I use this often as well, markets our students well. And so that transcript itself will be redesigned and we will um, run examples of that um, by large groups of folks, particularly colleges, businesses, et cetera, so we can get some feedback to make sure we're marketing our students well. Um, I know that, uh, I think it's South Portland, they use habits of work and learning and they've made an arrangement with employers in town if certain students um, can share their habits of work and learning because those are those behaviors they can get certain credits and they can also um, their employers can also will also hire students who have certain habits of work and learning frequency scores so that is a way of validating that those are the behaviors that certainly employers want to see grow in our students so moving forward at the high school, uh, LD 1666, which was passed in July, made the simple version of that is it made the proficiency-based diploma optional. Um, but it also, as it made it optional, also amended <coughs> approximately 21 other statutes related to education. So it is not a simple either-or piece. Um, we began as a leadership council to study that. Uh, and we're looking for what might make the best sense for Scarborough. Uh, the other piece that came out of the Leadership Council was it would be helpful to have clarification from the Department of Education. And at the last communication, they were consulting with their lawyers to find out exactly what this meant in terms of these two options. Some people seem to feel as if there'll be a differentiated diploma. Other people seem to feel as if, no, it's just a different way of reaching a, a diploma. We're not even clear at this point okay, who do we tell we want one option or another? Who, what, what, so we're without guidance at this point. The districts that I'm in communication with, about uh, a dozen or so, are basically moving forward with the policies that they've had in place. They are also having a wait and see to see what guidance will come from the DOE. In the meantime, I think we will be working on gathering feedback from folks on our current system, both in terms of the grading and reporting and in terms of our graduation requirements as well. Because graduation requirements set at the local level must meet state minimum standards, but the community can also add um, requirements on top of that as well. 
So um, right now it's a wait and see. We have graduation requirements in place, the grading and reporting. We're looking at in instituting a similar process, quite similar to the middle school where we've got lots of information from the teachers, got lots of information from parents, got lots of information from students in order to make some shifts in our grading and reporting practices at the high school so that we can do that better balance between that grading for learning and that grading of learning to communicate better to um, our students and our community. So I know that was quite a uh, gulp in 18 minutes. Uh, hopefully you took down some questions and things and I have some friends here at the table with me tonight who can help with the details. Uh, we tried to get some teachers to come tonight, but um, given the short notice that we provided uh, in their busy schedules, they were unable to make it tonight. Um, for you. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. I don't have a question. I have some information. I was at the Maine School Boards Association meeting a week ago, and Brian Langley, who is the chair, current chair, of the Education Committee, who is termed out, by the way. So he's probably done by now. And uh, where's the other man's name? Ed Cervoni, is it Cervoni? Ed Cervoni from Maine Educate from, Maine. From Educate Maine and Maine Spark. Mm -hmm. Spent two hours with the board. And let me give you a synopsis. I was going to make this a little later, but I think it's pertinent. Number one. Brian Langley speculates that with the demise of this bill, that Maine may adopt the Massachusetts standards. So we should be aware of that. He thinks we should take a pro, we being local, should take a proactive approach to educating our children and keeping the focus on proficiency based by engaging the community, and especially the business community, asking for their help. And in some instances, uh, businesses are donating equipment and providing uh, ongoing employees coming into the classroom to help with instruction in certain areas. And it's up to the locals to engage those folks. We already have a committee uh, with businesses, so uh, we're one step ahead of some communities. Every student needs a chance to be in the business community and needs the assistance of the entire community. So uh, how did we get here? It seems as though the legislature wanted to make certain that we had a basis for education in the state of Maine. And according to Mr. Langley, Senator Langley, uh, the greatest opponent to this was the Maine Education Association, which is a huge lobby. And it's his estimate that that's the reason that it was defeated in this last session. So. The state is working backwards at the moment, and it's backed away from its responsibilities uh, to provide the best education possible for our youngsters. And they've backed away from providing the resources as well. So it's something that we need to do as a community to fund positions for youngsters, especially those who are not going on to college. And Proficiency-based was an equalizer, in their opinion. And I'll back up a hair. Brian Langley uh, was an instructor in uh, the Ellsworth Tech School. He, he's a chef, so it, for many years he was, he was teaching those skills to youngsters, as well as running a restaurant in, in Ellsworth. So that's just a synopsis of what transpired re regarding PBE at the state level in the last couple of months. And thank you, Monique, for this wonderful presentation. I mean, it was a lot of wonderful it was great. information. And I really do like that um, the idea of the grading to improve learning versus just grading. You know, that I really can uh, relate to that, and I, I think that's a, a positive 
positive change. I had one question um, regarding the power school or the the idea of doing electronic grading for K to five. You know, would it be possibly a power school type? You know, would it be power school or would it be a, are there other? You know, we would use the power school application okay. in order to do the um, reporting and build the report card. Um, one of the reasons why we aren't using that in terms of a grade book is that the technology was pretty traditional in terms of um, everything needing to be in courses, and that isn't necessarily the way our elementary schools are organized. So we've never really been happy with an application in terms of a grade book, but we can also do the report card through that application as well. Okay. And then I wondered, because I know um, a few folks from the district went to that power school university and you said there were still some issues you know with the you know um, electronic grading I guess at the middle school and I just wonder was that helpful going to that you know did that help solve some of those issues yes very much so it, um, it, it's a um, an application that is used by over millions of school personnel and it is an application that manages a number of different functions. It's our student information system, so it helps with scheduling as well as reporting and those sorts of pieces. And they do updates, um, periodic updates, so it's important for us to keep current um, to really understand and know what's changing and what's shifting and how we need to change our settings to keep up and take advantage of all that it is that it offers over time. So it was valuable. I, I think Diane attended if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, it was very valuable, and again, um, it was especially helpful for us at the middle school as um, we were reconceptualizing what we wanted our reporting system to look like. And so we were able to have um, really taken apart all of the survey feedback with our teachers um, that we had gotten back <coughs> from teachers and parents and students. And we had a lot of ideas of uh, to take with us, like we would like it to do this, we want it to do that, we want it to do this other thing and we were able to really be on the ground and say um, you know take advantage of both the courses that we went to as well as open lab time to meet one-on-one -on -one with experts and say here's what here's what we envision it wanted to, wanting it to do help me to know how to then go back and make that happen so we felt like it was very um, successful for us to have attended well, it's amazing to hear like how it sounds like it's it's a tool that can be used not just for parents and kids to look there at. It's, a lot like, of there's modules. so much more. Right. There's so much more yep. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And part of our um, intent in sending the middle school team this summer was to really expand capacity and build more capacity across the district, so more users know how to use mm -hmm. all of the aspects of it. Because it really, we're just beginning to use a a bit of its potential and so what we want to be able to do is be able to create dynamic reports and um, really have data at teachers from the tip so that they can make really smart decisions smarter decisions about their students and their lesson planning it's been um, something that teachers are asking for um, I have a question as you think about putting or using a digital report card for k5 sorry my voice. Um, do you mean where you, a parent, would be able to see the report card at the end of the trimester digitally? Or are you more envisioning the type of thing with power school where it's like a day-to-day -day change? Because I can't imagine that with K-5, so that would be... Yeah, because... because I, was I was just, I'm wondering what the... Right, right, right. K-5 folks have not, teachers have not used an electronic grade book before, so we would start out and make incremental shifts there. Um, also, grade books don't really do a great job of capturing the kinds of things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in an elementary classroom, and that's why we have, have resisted, ha you know, using that application for that purpose. So we're exploring it. It's, it's a very flexible tool, but we're going to start out by just having teachers enter in the information for their report cards each trimester. We're just trying to get to that okay. point first. That's what I was... Um, okay. And then I know that, um, again, with the K-5, I'm just looking at your redesign considerations. Like, I'm just trying to think back from my kids' guiding principles. I feel like there's so much overlap between those and some of the habits of work and learning that are you thinking of doing, like, a guiding principles effort and howls, like, as three separate? Are you adding howls into it? Like, well, that's one name? of the pieces that, uh, in terms of the feedback we got from the teachers, is we've got to simplify those pieces. We may 
report differently on guiding principles um, and include just the howls. Um, but at each of the schools, they, there are behaviors that they've worked on with students. You know, you can see the posters in the classrooms and things. So we're trying to incorporate those pieces right. into the howls to then be report on the howls separate from the guiding principles. Okay, so it would be a separate section? That's my thinking is it would be separate. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if we're even going to report on guiding principles because that may take on a different shape. It may be on the report card, um, but it may take on a different shape because we're really talking for guiding principles. We're talking about what are the pieces of evidence. Um, we want to teach students to reflect on their work. We want to teach students to um, set goals for themselves. We want them to know themselves well as a clear and effective communicator, as a problem solver and such. Mm -hmm. And so it may look more like a portfolio kind of thing or maybe a student teacher led conference kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It may not be something that would make sense to report on each trimester. Okay. I'd like Dylan to weigh in on this. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you're in it. That's true, yeah. Um, I actually did have one question that I kept looking back on just to like make sure I wasn't overlooking anything. Why are the middle and high school feedback skills different like numbers or codes? Thank you, Dylan. That was um, my next question. Oh, really? <laughs> too. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the... Uh, it, it has to do with when they decided on making those shifts. The middle school had similar codes in the past, mm -hmm. but as a result of the feedback that they got, um, that the letters were preferable than the numbers. So we may get that same feedback for the high school, and we may shift to a different, it, it's just a symbol system, uh, may shift to a different symbol system that might have more meaning. Letters tend to have more meaning because you can attach the words more easily. So we may shift in that way. It depends on what the feedback comes out. Would that change also include with the categories? Looking at what the middle school has and seeing that at the high school level, it varies. It can be teacher to teacher, as you said, or departments. Having that consistency, would that be more helpful so that maybe the students aren't trying to shop teachers mm -hmm. um, to find somebody who maybe will grade a little easier? Quite possibly so. Do you mean um, the classwork 20%, homework 10%? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Quite possibly so. Um, we're going to look at the feedback on that in terms and get feedback from the um, teaching staff on that. Um, the middle school has had more of a history of having consistent categories and consistent grading practices. The high school has not. It's been much more open-ended at the high school. I think the important thing to, to consider when you're looking at the middle school changes is that it was very teacher-led. And Diane, you could speak more to the process, but every thing that even those categories were all um, developed by the teachers mm -hmm. um, right. and rolled out by the teachers. They even yeah. presented it to the parents this year. So do you want to talk a little bit about that part? Yeah, I certainly can. I mean, we really wanted to engage the whole school community, parents, students, um, and our teachers in helping us to figure out, you know, we had a problem of practice, right? Um, we got some pretty clear feedback that although the intention was really positive in terms of the shifts um, that were implemented last year, that people were feeling like they weren't having the kind of specific feedback that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so in going back and kind of peeling the layers of those onions, right, in terms of all the survey feedback, um, we had a couple of things that work. So um, first off, we engaged all of our teachers in pulling apart that survey feedback. Um, and so it wasn't just a representative group. Like, for example, like at a whole staff meeting, we broke into three groups, and one group really focused on let's dig into the student feedback and see what we can call out for the big things from that. Another group took a dive at the parent feedback, and a third group took a dive at the staff feedback. So that, again, we, were, we really wanted everyone to be that close to the work. Um, and then from that, we had a grading and reporting committee um, that was a representative group of about a dozen staff members um, who helped to kind of call out the flesh um, that became the grading and reporting guide, right? 
or some of these changes in terms of the selection of the categories and those kinds of things. And at the same time, we had our Habits of Work and Learning Committee that had been an ongoing group that had been working through the year, really doing some deep thinking about those three categories that we had been using, respect, engagement, preparation for learning. And folks were feeling like there were some, some perhaps student behaviors both on the academic responsibility side and the social responsibility side that really didn't fit in either in any of those three buckets. Mm -hmm. And so they really had this re reconceptualization of what if we had, you know, the academic here and the social here and then we gave that feedback. So certainly I think there are some differences here when when we look at number one, where we were last year and where we are now, and also some differences in terms of some of the language um, and terms that are used in comparison to where the high school is, but I think what's underneath that, right, like we had a big conversation about that, especially in regards to the habits of work and learning. Mm -hmm. Underneath all of that, there is still that same commitment to wanting to report that feedback to students and to families but we felt like this allowed us the ability to make it more meaningful and more inclusive of lots of behaviors. Gotcha. Thank you. Hopefully so can you just speak a little bit to like, so I'm looking at that same slide and it's like middle school reporting component and there's mm -hmm. a zero to 100 and then there's reported feedback and that's the EMPM. Mm -hmm. So like, can you just give some insight as to what type of thing would use the 0 to 100 scale as, appo as so, opposed to what type of thing right. would use the... So that's a great question. And so in the system that's been developed, those two pieces are married together. Okay. So for every assignment, whether it's classwork, homework, or assessment, a student is going to receive a numerical score or percentage, okay. right? And then if you... And again, there are directions, right? Yeah. Um, but if you click on the assignment, you're going to see um, what's going to lay underneath that is going to be the specific learning goals or standards that are attached to that assignment. Okay. So, you know, so Dave might get a 94 on his math homework. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I'm his mom, I can click on that. And I can see below that what the learning goal was that was attached to that assignment. Okay, so for that specific goal, he would then get the exceeds or meets based right. on what the numerical score was. Well, it's or, so it's not necessary. So it's not necessarily based on the numeric score. Like okay. for example, like a homework, right? Yeah. Like, did you meet the expectation of what that homework is? Because again, keep in mind that not every assignment in our current system has an exceeds component, right? Like okay. we might be doing some classwork and my expectation is that everybody's going to do something similar, so there might just be a meets expectation. Okay. Conversely, on the assessment side of things, we're working to ensure that every assessment has an exceeds component okay. built in, right? Okay. Because right. when you're doing that deeper dive in terms of do you own this information, at what level can we push your understanding to okay. on the assessments? We really need to see that. But on a day-to-day -day classwork right. or homework piece, that may not be the case. Okay. Is that helpful? Yes, it's helpful to my question and okay. also my personal yep. question okay. on my daughter's <laughs> right. personal thing. Right. Um, <laughs> So I, I guess my other question for Monique is, um, we heard a lot this spring about like the hybrid grading. Mm -hmm. Is this high school grading and reporting a reflection of that? A yes, it's grading? a hybrid just because it utilizes both the zero to 100 on courses, but the what we call, what might call a proficiency scale on the content within those courses, the standards and learning goals. So for example, if there was a writing assignment that students needed to do, they would get a percentage grade on the writing assignment but on that writing assignment, there might be two learning goals attached to that. It could be um, grammar, and it could be um, uh, organization in the writing. And so a student might get like the 85, but they might be stronger in grammar, and that might be a meet, but maybe it's the 
idea, excuse me, the sequencing of the story that needs work, and so there might be a partially meets there. That's the feedback for learning so that students right. can take the next steps in their learning. Yep. And then after that year that they piloted that, there was never any survey or anything like the middle school did? Or are you planning on doing well, that? The, the, the high school's only in their second year of the system. Oh, okay. So this is the year for us to gather information and okay. feedback. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't have a high school student yet, but the middle school I know did it after the first year, so I was just wondering what your plan was for the feedback. Yeah. We began that conversation today with, uh, excuse me, at, actually at the ILT meeting yesterday with gathering some information from teachers, and we're going to do a more comprehensive approach in terms of some survey and getting feedback from parents okay. as well as students. No, it is just so nice to be talking about educational issues at this table. Thank you very much. One of the other things to add to um, the work that's been going on across the district is that over the course of last year, Monique um, and others worked to get all of our curriculum onto an internal curriculum guide website. That has been really helpful to have it all in one place and you can see k-12 what are the identified standards and then you can see the units that have been developed in the pacing guides and now our teachers um, as we've redesigned our late start wednesdays or our professional learning times are able to access that information really easily um, but then also can see where has good work been done and where is their good work ready to be done um, so they can be working in their job alike teams on those late start Wednesdays to really continue to enhance and improve the curriculum as well, in addition to this other component of the grade and report mm -hmm. system. So we're really excited about that and, and grateful for that work because it's something that we everyone had been looking for and asking for. Um, and it's really quite nice. And Monique can speak more to it, um, but the long range vision is to then be able to make components of it open to the public so parents can see, well, what is the pacing guide and what can I expect my, my student to learn this year in this course right. um, as we continue to develop that. Jeff. I have a question I just happened to think of. We have, uh, we've been told, and I'm fairly certain it's correct, it, Somewhere in the vicinity of 95 to 98% of our students participate <laughs> in some form of extracurricular activity. How does that impact what we're trying to do in the learning process? Uh, well, Julie can speak more, um, probably more eloquent than I can on the impact of that. Um, we. Um, having students involved in all aspects of what a school offers is certainly to their benefit, um, but it also helps in that um, they're more engaged during school hours and they do better academically is generally the... I would just like to comment. It, goes to, it speaks to uh, transcript versus a resume today. You know, um, transcript is one piece where a transcript used to be it. But really, when you're looking at post-secondary, whether you're looking at a job, you really have to create a resume. And some of those things play a huge impact in how you are marketing yourself and what you know and what you can do. And that piece I understand. What I'm getting at is we have goals for our students. And if, is it possible, I guess is the question, if a student doesn't meet a goal in an academic area, is there some way that, that I don't want to say a goal, what do I want to say, points along the way that to be proficient? Mm -hmm. Is there a way for them to get points, if you will, through extracurricular activities? Do um, our coaches one of the pieces. and our advisors participate in that evaluation of the student beyond are they a good football player, or can they sing, or? Yeah, at present, I don't think the mechanism is in place yet, but we're certainly having conversations around that. Once we're clear about what our achievement targets are, it becomes um, an opportunity, and that's one piece of the um, legislation, the, the proficiency-based diploma legislation, that almost mandated multiple opportunities for being able to not only learn, but also demonstrate. Um, it also opened the door in terms of referring to learning experiences as opposed to courses mm -hmm. um, so that students can have 
what I refer to, you know, those extracurriculars are real life activities. If you're involved in the key club, you are doing service and that should be a part of your piece of, of things. But maybe that activity might be a piece of evidence that you might want to use in order to demonstrate that you are becoming a more responsible and involved citizen. Um, so that could lead to credit for that is that, that part of your portfolio if you're putting that together. It could be even now for a classroom teacher could accept those sorts of external experiences for some of the, um, in order to show proficiency in certain areas if they align with the particular activity. Today we, we had our vote meeting, you were there Jackie, and one of the things that Westbrook Vogue is starting this year is to work on looking at the things they do and how some of, they might be able to tag some of the um, guiding principles, not, not guiding principles, but some of the learning goals and targets in ways, maybe not to cover a whole course, but that there may be certain pieces of what they're doing at Vogue that we may be able to come up with a common language and be able to, if they can't show it in one course or in the traditional setting, they might be able to meet that proficiency at Vogue. And um, they're starting to work um, with Great Schools Partnership and um, are going to start articulating that. And we've asked, um, today I asked Michelle Shupp, our instructional coach, if she would attend that book meeting, because I think if they're on the ground getting started, that would be a good time for our, for our presence to be at those meetings. So that's one piece. The other piece, um, Jackie, I think where we're going to see the activities and sports and athletics, and, and not even just limited to what Scarborough High School offers, but the many things that our children do outside. Um, I got an email today from a parent that her daughter is competing at the national figure skating level. And, and you gotta, you got to be sure that some of the things uh, on those guiding principles are things she is gaining from that, that very high level experience she's having. So I see some of those things as um, they're, where they're going to really shine and show for kids is in the guiding principles and how they're using some of those experiences to build those soft skills uh, that they need as an adult. I, I think that's where we'll see a lot of that work. But I think as, as Voc leads the way on some of this work, that might open the conversation for us to look at other experiences students have and be able to tie that into showing proficiencies in some ways. Well, you've heard me say for years that we spend a lot of time and energy and money on activities in this community. And we give it a lot of attention. And it has to be, in my opinion, an educational experience for our students for me to continue to support it. And if it's an educational experience, then it must have some weight in a child's performance, overall performance. And I truly, truly hope that we continue looking at those alternative pathways so that our students can meet those goals. Uh, and I, I may not be on the board, but I'm gonna hold your hand to the fire, quite frankly. Well, just in terms of a return on investment, Jackie, the the research is really crystal clear that students who are involved in activities, so not just sports, but I mean, Dylan's involved in I think, you know, 50% of the clubs we offer somehow. I don't know how he has that many hours in the day. Not to mention he, you know, coordinates all the clubs. Um, but we know that students who are consistently involved in extracurricular activities are 70% more likely to go on to a two year or a four year college than students who are intermittently involved. And the data is like 400% more likely than students who are not involved in all, at all. And that's just not just going on to college, but being more successful, obtaining higher incomes, um, having healthier relationships. There's even some studies that have been done around dementia and other, you know, um, risk factors that, you know, that come along with aging, they're looking back at what is the level of involvement in extracurriculars, and there is a strong correlation between that involvement and healthy life outcomes. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> active, active, 81. And, and also, um, as a teacher, part of, our, um, part of our vision for thinking about the educational experience in general is, you know, do we, do we start to give our students credit 
for, or do we make it a graduation um, requirement that they have X number of hours in community services? A lot of districts in Maine right around us have already done that. We um, discussed it. Some have even done things like for, this is a little bit of a tangent, but like snow days, can you make up a snow day with community service hours and things like that? Because we know that, um, that, that civic engagement is so critical, right? Um, and we've also talked a bit about, you know, wellness expectations for students. So if a student is dancing 15 hours a week, you know, do, can that count as a gym credit as opposed to them, you know, dancing 15 hours a week and us making them, you know, have certain seat time for courses and things like that. Um, but also we have students who are really involved in other types of things like mindfulness and yoga. And so how do we honor some of those wellness, Absolutely. lifelong wellness activities, even if it's not necessarily a school sanctioned thing. And we've started to have some conversations with community members and local business owners who um, are also interested in partnering us. Thank you very stuff. much. Yep. Are there any other questions from board members or comments? All I can say is that if I had started a resume in freshman year, to keep track of everything I've done, I'd be a lot more grateful than having filled one out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you want to say anything? Um, I just, I agree with that, that um, extracurriculars are very important. And I would say that some of the clubs that I'm in have contributed to, like, be, me becoming a better learner. For example, I was in Model UN this past year, mm -hmm. and I definitely noticed that it's helped me more in, like, history and social studies. Um, so I definitely feel like clubs like that contribute to students learning today. Thank you. Allison, can I put you on the spot a little bit and ask you to talk a little bit about um, you know, some of these changes that are happening both at the state level and local level and how that um, impacts some of our students receiving special services and or gifted and talented and or English language learners? Well, it's about all students. Mm -hmm. So I think this is wonderful about the learning targets, uh, that all the students' learning is connected to a standard, is connected to a learning goal. It may not be your grade level. It may be lower, or it may be more advanced, depending on where you are. Um, so everything that's being discussed applies to all of those different subgroups. Uh, I love this. Um, because it is connecting, especially for students with more, uh, a higher level of disability, it is connecting their learning to a standard. It is legitimizing in, in education that their learning is important. They are making progress. They can even take a grade level standard and have that modified with the, um, how they show their learning. You can be nonverbal, but still take in everything that's around you. So I think this language and this transformation in education only values our inclusivity more for all of our students. I think it's great. And, and I think i um, really proud of Scarpo that we stood firm in being able to adapt um, the graduation expectations to a, a person's own ability and their own ability to make growth not a standard for all equally. Because we are not made equally. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think over, I, I've always loved that the, the K2 report card kind of like feeds into the 3-5 report card. There's like a lot of consistency, even though the Wentworth report card is obviously a little bit more in depth and has some different aspects to it. So I'm glad to see that the middle school and high school is coming a little bit closer together. I think that would be, I think that would be nice too if we had, you know, like a K-5 and then, you know, you move to like the kind of upper, upper school and the 612 had a lot of consistency as well. I understand that there are some differences just like there are between the primary and Wentworth. Um, but I like that we're, it seems like we're moving in that direction. That feels consistent to me. Well, I appreciate all the work and the thought that goes into all of this, you know, work. You speak up, Mary. I'm sorry. I appreciate all the all the work and thought that's gone into these, these processes at all the all the school at, at all school levels. It's it's really wonderful to hear how the uh, leadership council is working with teachers and staff to to create a system that really works for our, our schools. 
question. I guess with that, um, there are no other questions. I think we'll break. We will adjourn for uh, briefly, and then we will have our business meeting.
meeting to order. Welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Um, today is still September 20th. Moving on from our workshop, could I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. And Ms. Caldwell? Here. Thank you. Um, could you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, agenda item 4.0, are there any adjustments to the agenda? I believe there are none. Or actually, I misspoke. Um, from the agenda that was originally posted last week, we did add 6.0, which is welcome and introductions of our new school board rep, um, which bumps everything else down on the list. Thank you. Um, agenda 5.0, public comment on agenda items. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment? Um, seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, agenda item 6.0, welcome and introduction of our new school student school board representation. Represent. So it's Bill. my pleasure to announce uh, Kristen Caldwell is our new school board rep for the class of 2020. Um, she had some few remarks, so. so. Uh, I just want to thank the school board for giving me this opportunity to re represent myself and all the school system and I will work my hardest to make this a great year for all the students in the schools. And thank you very much. Welcome. 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 Yeah. Dylan, could you speak a little bit to the process? How does a student um, get nominated and then selected to participate sure. on the school board? So each year the senior rep will work with the principal to kind of form an election and like, it can be different depending on the year, but this, like this year, Ms. Ketch and I sent an email out to the entire class of 2020 with all the information regarding what the job is, how the like role works and what we do. And then we, along with the email, we sent out, uh, we had an announcement made and we gave them a week and a half, I believe, to write their name on a ballot. And after that, I sent them each a personal email talking about any more information about the job and when the election would be. And when the election came, it was yesterday, um, <laughs> we had all of student council and the student government, along with club officers and leaders, student <coughs> leaders, and they all came to the auditorium and we, because in the policy it says the student body would elect it, the person, but in, it, in the past it's been easier just to have people elected by the student body vote. So we had about 50 people come and they, we had the uh, candidates give their speech and from there they voted. We tallied the votes and announced the winner. Great, and how many students were running this year? This year we had seven students. Wow. wow. The most in a while. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Really good. Thank you for leading that work, Dylan. Oh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and welcome, Kristen. Thank yeah, you. we're happy to have you join us and appreciate your willingness to share your perspective. Thank you. Contribute your ideas, so great. Uh, agenda item 7.0, um, new school board orientation. Um, this, um, after the election, we will have five new school board members, and as has been done in the past, we'll have a school board orientation meeting for the board. Uh, as noted in school board policy BIA uh, 3.0, um, it states an orientation meeting will be convened by the board for the primary purpose of orienting the new members to his or her responsibilities to the board's method of operating and to school department policies and problems. Um, so therefore the election, just to kind of go through some kind of housekeeping, the election will take place on November 6th. The election will be certified by the at the next council meeting, which will be on November 14th. Um, the newly elected board members will be sworn in um, by our town clerk, and then they will attend their first meeting on November 15th. Um, so we have tentatively scheduled the orientation for, all, for the entire board on <coughs> November 15th from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, in the past, uh, the boards have used a consultant to facilitate the training, um, sometimes from either Maine School Management Association or Drummond Woodsum, our school attorney. Um, we're exploring options you know, for a facilitator and we'll be coordinating to find that person uh, who will best fit the board's needs. 
Uh, after the orientation, the new board will meet at 7 p.m. that same evening on November 15th, and they would elect their chair and vice chair. Um, and that night, the business meeting, it is a business meeting, but it will be short. Um, we don't anticipate a long meeting. Um, at this time, we'll expect it to only include the election and any essential matters. Um, Julie, did you have anything to add on? Nope. Um, that, uh, the only thing is that who the facilitator is will really just yes. depend on availability because yeah. November's a busy month with lots of elections happening, and yeah. so um, we're currently exploring a couple of different options. Yes. Yeah. Any comments by board members? Okay. Uh, so moving on to 8.1, um, the motion to enhance the recognition process. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Hillary, um, would you mind giving an overview of this process since you kind of have charged sure. this? So um, something we had been talking about in communications for a while, I brought it up. Um, uh, I don't know, like a month ago or so, and we've kind of refined the idea and um, brought it again. So what we're looking at doing is um, at the business meeting each, well, actually, no, just the first meeting of each um, month, we usually do recognitions, and we're just looking at um, expanding that and kind of turning it into an enhanced recognition process so that we can celebrate some of the things that are happening in our district. Um, it's going to be, um, so we'll be sending out a, a letter to the administrators and the teachers in all the schools. Um, it'll give them the guidelines for um, what types of things, what types of things that we're looking for. Just some, I mean, it can kind of be anything that you think is exceptional. Um, but we did do a few guidelines, um, phil a philanthropic project, a random act of kindness, academic achievements, sports or club achievements, volunteer projects, innovative projects, or any other amazing thing that you are proud of for some student or staff member. Um, so um, there's, there will be a nomination form on the intranet, which is like the internal thing for the, um, the staff. Um, it's just a Google form. Anyone can fill it out. Um, we'll look at all the entries for each month and hopefully pick somebody to be recognized each month. They'll be able to come to the board meeting. They can bring their family and friends. They'll get an awesome certificate. Um, and the, um, we'll just be able to share a little bit more about like what is so amazing that's, that's, act, you know, that's happening in our schools. Does anyone have any questions about that? Or? I, oh, you don't. I just want to say thank you for coming up with this idea. Um, we talk about all the time how do we tell our story better, and you know, often at leadership we we talk about how we're so busy doing the work that we don't we know we don't tell our story as well as we should. And there really are amazing things happening in our schools every day. So just the fact that anyone can choose to recognize a student or a staff member. Um, at any time, I think it's going to be um, really good for our culture and our climate across the district. And I also think that it's a great way for our staff to celebrate their hard work through their professional learning teams and the, and mm -hmm. the progress that they're making. Um, instead of waiting until the end of the year to have that big giant celebration, we can celebrate along the way. So I think it's going to be um, a really exciting uh, opportunity for everyone. So thank you. Sure. Are you going to share your... No, it's going to be a surprise for you. Okay, I will share. <laughs> I have a really cool flyer that's going with it. Because <laughs> it's, it's nice. I like it. Yeah, no, I, I, it's I, very attractive. Yeah. <laughs> now the, I won't spoil the secret. Now the interest is peaked. You know, <laughs> they're on the edge of their seats now. Yeah. Now um, they'll really read it. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I appreciate all the work that went into this, Hillary, and I think it's a wonderful idea. I just had a couple just just kind of basic questions. Yeah. Like, how will the winner be chosen? So, <laughs> so... So, I, like, if, you know, if someone... Right. You know, because I know you can only... Because are you going only going to have, like, one person... A, or or be, could there be multiple? I guess that's my other... Well, it kind of depends, I think, on... You know, we've left it really open-ended because we want mm -hmm. people to be able to nominate anyone. Like, you can nominate a food service worker or a teacher or a student or... Um, or like, we also wanted to leave the possibility open for somebody to nominate, like, an entire club. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, obviously, there would, like, the yeah. club would, 
if that if those people were chosen to be recognized, that would be a group that would be recognized yeah. for a group effort um, or an individual. Uh, so what's going to happen is when the forms uh, when the Google forms are filled out, it'll come to it'll come to me, and then I'll bring it up at the communications committee meeting, and we'll just go over everything mm -hmm. um, there, and then we'll make the decision in okay. committee. Oh, well, that makes mm -hmm. sense. And so can because I know you said staff cannot can students nominate. Someone like with not, the help of staff, maybe. Oh, I just well, wonder, like, is there so is there a mechanism? We talked that about that, at, like at the time, just because we're kind of piloting this and saying mm -hmm. we're leaving it um, available for s only for adults to nominate at this time. Um, but it is something that we had thought about whether we could open it for students to nominate each other and staff members. Um, so we are going to keep that like in the back of our heads. But for now, it's only going to be adults. Um, but that is amazing. Like if you know, if Dylan had some teacher, he could go to another teacher and say, "This amazing thing happened, and yeah. I just want to, you know, talk to you about it and ask you to consider nominating them for this." Yeah. And so that would be a good way to bring it to somebody's attention. So maybe that could be in some of the. Yeah, you know, we could know. We about, could know. You know. That might be nice to kind of say that in the if 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 that is something that you'd want to have to have that in the in the paperwork so that you know students could know they could go to a staff member and. Know, so the if, if that's something the information know. about it right now like the letter that we have mocked up I mean it's not like a, it's not totally final it's just a draft but um, is going only to the staff okay. so it's not going to the oh, students um, but we do have my amazing flyer which could be put up at <laughs> the schools in which case it might be a good idea at the bottom to say you know if you are a student who would like to nominate somebody, please talk to your advisory or yeah. your, you know, or your classroom teacher. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Now you're just piquing that interest even more. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments regarding it? So are we are we ready for a vote? I guess. Um, all those in favor of the motion to enhance our recognition process? Be four and two. Thank you. The motion's carried. Um, so we'll be doing that. That's great. Um, moving on to 8.2 appointments. 8.2.1 school position. Um, could I ask um, Patty Bolduck, our wonderful nurse at the middle school, is here to introduce our new um, school position, Dr. Fanberg. Patty? So it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Fanberg, who has agreed to be our new school physician. Dr. Fanberg earned his undergraduate degree at Bowdoin and his med medical degree at Vanderbilt. He um, is board certified in both adolescent medicine and pediatrics. He has practiced in Maine for the last 20 years, 10 in Ellsworth, where he was also the Ellsworth School Physician two at Central Maine Medical and the last eight at Maine Medical Center physician. He's been at Maine Medical Center, Maine Medical Partners, excuse me, in South Portland Pediatrics. He is a very active member of the medical community serving as medical director of the Division of Adolescents and Young Adult Medicine. He is the associate medical director of, four, of primary care for four pediatric clinics. He also, in and my, look at my colleagues for this, Ann, and, um, Ann Ornstein and Suzanne Kenny are also here. He started a forum um, several years ago for local school nurses and at times social workers on pertinent topics so that it, he provided education to us. He calls, he calls us and says, what would you like to m learn more about? And it's been an opportunity for us to get together with school nurses from South Portland, Yarmouth, Falmouth, um, and Cape Elizabeth, which has just been wonderful. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fanberg. Thanks, thanks for the kind introduction, Pat. Um, healthy kids are more effective kids in the classroom. That's the, what the data shows. And so their grades are better, they miss less school, the parents miss less work, take them to the doctor's office. So that's, that's my real target as a school physician. The job, what I see it as including, is working with school nurses, educational resource, meeting with them periodically, uh, being available for questions that come up from a healthcare standpoint. I see the job included as far as when new healthcare policies come up, either revised or new ones, that I have a chance to potentially hopefully look at them and give some feedback on them. 
Um, I see myself as being available to administration related to emerging health issues as they come up. What, what we're learning in healthcare is the social determinants of health are more important than what I'm doing in my office. And so how safe your playground is, whether they get a high school degree is probably more important than I listen to the heart and get a blood pressure. Mm. And so my target is looking at the population health and how do I improve that in the long term. I, I see your students on a regular basis from Scarborough and elsewhere you know, every day, but I also love working with the population. How can I improve that? So that's my target. Questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The recommendation is to appoint Dr. Fanberg as the Scarborough School Physician. So moved. Second. Good discussion? No, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and being yes. with us and helping our children and our nurses. These are great nurses, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they were um, unanimous in um, our discussions about a school physician and spoke very, very highly of you. So I'm pleased that you're joining us. Absolutely. All those in favor? Four and two. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, agenda item 8.2.2, high school math teacher. Dan Crowley has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Mr. Crowley earned his bachelor's degree in European history from Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. He earned several undergraduate cre credits in mathematics from both New York University and Columbia University. He received his master's degree from the University of Southern Maine in special education. Mr. Crowley has been an education technician at Scarborough High School for the past two years and was a substitute teacher for Scarborough schools prior to this. Mr. Crowley will be placed on step one of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Dan Crowley as Scarborough High School math teacher. So moved. Second. Discussion? The only thing I would add is that if you've been to any Scarborough event ever <laughs> in the last two years, you have probably seen Dan sitting in the stands. He is super involved with our kids and um, also just recently bought a house here in Scarborough and recently got engaged. So lots of good things happening for Dan and we're super excited to welcome him yes, to the sure. high school. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, all those in favor? Four and two. Thank you. Uh, Agenda item 8.2.3, middle school science teacher. Laurel um, Herendine has been selected to fill this position created by a realignment. <laughs> Ms. Herendine received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Science of Earth Systems from Cornell University. She received her Master of Science for Teachers in Childhood Education from State University of New York. Ms. Herendine has been teaching Earth Science, Biology, and Math at Bethlehem Central Middle School in Del Mar, New York for 11 years. Ms. Herendine will be placed on step 12 of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Ms. Laurel Herendine as middle school science teacher. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Four and two. Thank you. Uh, 8.2.4, the seventh grade boys soccer coach. Um, in your packet, you have a uh, recommendation to appoint Kevin Philbrook as the fall seventh grade boys soccer coach, um, and this position is funded through the general fund. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Four, four, two. Um, before we adjour adjourn, I did want to uh, mention that um, we have recently scheduled a um, Q&A night for all the candidates um, for school board. Since we have so many candidates this year, we thought it would be helpful to have a, a Q&A night so um, candidates can come, ask questions of um, the current board and the superintendent and assistant superintendent will be here as well as we've also invited um, Steve Bailey, who is the president of uh, Maine School Management Association. Yep. Executive director. Uh, executive director. Uh, thank you. Um, and so he'll be there as well to kind of to help out if there are any questions that um, might arise that, that he can help out with because he's kind of the expert on school boards in the state. And uh, so, so that event will be happening um, on October 29th from 7 to 8.30. And we are still um, looking for a location for it. So that's, that's to be determined at this point. But I just wanted to let, let folks know so they can put that on the calendar. Um, anyone who's a candidate for the school board this year. Um, so with that, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? 
four and two. All right. Thank you.